Hello there, everybody. Welcome back to Star Wars Lads. We have for you all a new type of tier list, the first one we will be doing in this format. And this is in honor of Rings of Power ending this week. We're going to be ranking every single Star Wars movie along with every single Lord of the Rings movies. And we did limit this to the live action theatrically released films and of course because this is a tier list it's relative to what we have here so that means you might think you've know our star wars rankings from the past and yes those are our star wars rankings based on the star wars franchise but when you compare it to another franchise like the middle earth franchise it might change where they fall on the tiers so we're going to be talking about all of these movies here before we do so make sure you hit that like button and subscribe for more content just like this so let's start again with star wars episode four a new hope the movie that kicked off the Star Wars franchise. I still think this is a masterpiece of pop sci-fi. This is kind of created a genre and film. It's a sci-fi fantasy that works so well. One of my favorite movies of all time. But when we compare it to the rest of the stuff with Lord of the Rings, I would say I would put this in A tier rather than S tier this time. And I do think it's not quite as good as some of the best movies in Middle Earth. A New Hope is like a foundational chapter for any sort of franchise so when i look at it and when i think about it what my heart says what my interest has been saying over the years yeah I, I still think just like how i was putting in my own positions for our most recent movies and tv shows tier list for star wars it is an a tier film for me comparing this to middle earth and star wars if it has such a strong position for me so for me I'll put it A tier, but I could see it slip to like bottom of A. And next we have Fellowship of the Ring, the first Lord of the Rings film. This is not one of my favorite ones. It it's it's my least favorite of the trilogy, but over time, especially since I got to see this again in extended editions, which are vastly superior to theatrical, regardless of what people say. Um, I got to see this again in theaters and back to back to back and it's been increasingly improving for me. Like I, this is a film that I do wish they spent a little bit more time in the Shire and like the escape from the Shire. But once you're actually on like the original D and D quest with the fellowship, once you're actually seeing them go through all these journeys and solving the puzzles and all that, it's hard not to get swept away. I don't know if I would personally put it at like bottom of S I would say top of a for sure, because there are a few films that I, do love a little bit more. I would put it in S tier. I love The Fellowship of the Ring. This is one of my favorite movies of all time. I love origin stories. I love beginnings of franchises. And I don't know of really any franchise that does the first film better than Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Ring. It really embraces the world. And like you said, this, the extended edition of this one is the shortest, but it is extremely effective in what they did add and what they cut. And it doesn't really make the theatrical any weaker. It just makes this one even better. And this movie, every time I start it, I get swept away. I absolutely love Fellowship. And if we are comparing A New Hope to Fellowship, I do think Fellowship is a little bit better movie. I would put it in S tier. Okay. Yeah, I'm fine with putting it bottom of S. Well, then that takes us back to Star Wars for The Empire Strikes Back. The Empire Strikes Back, one of the greatest movies of all time. I love this movie. It's in my favorite movies of all time, too. This is an excellent sequel, and I do think easily is the best Star Wars movie. As I've said in every tier list we've done about Star Wars movies and rankings, it is not my favorite Star Wars movie. It's my second favorite Star Wars movie, but it's one of the great movies of all time, one of the best second movies in any franchise ever. It's also easily an S tier for me, and I would put it ahead of Fellowship of the Ring. Yeah, this is top of S tier for me. Uh gonna put it out there i don't think anything's gonna beat that for me just because i do think this is one of the best examples ever of a sequel that not only does things differently like a lot of great sequels too but also makes a really concerted effort to build out flesh out the world i really find no flaw at all with empire strikes back for a film made in 1980 it still outclasses films made today from the top auteurs, from the top directors in the game. Yeah, I'll put this at top of S. Next, we're going to continue on with another Star Wars film, and that is Episode Six: Return of the Jedi. This is a common theme for me, but this is not really one of my favorite Star Wars films. This is one that used to be one of my favorites when I was a kid. I absolutely love the green lightsaber of Luke, the journey that he goes through. That being said, over time, I have kind of soured on the effectiveness of the Jabba's Plows plot. It's great to see the underworld 
I just don't really see it more than kind of like an isolated bit where a lot of the decision making of the heroes, it's not one of my favorite stuff, but I can't deny that final third is magical, right? Even if you don't like the Ewoks, I do, right? And if that's the weakest part of that film in that final third, when you have the incredible Darth Vader complexity and breakdown that has been building out throughout that film, you know, the incredible duel that happens there when we get to see it, the role of Ian McDermott as Palpatine, that Star 2 battle, which still looks fantastic even today. Ah, there's so much I love about this film. There's so much I just, I struggle with this film. I would put this as a B tier. For me, Return of the Jedi is an A tier. I love Return of the Jedi. And like you said, it is that final third act that just to me is one of the greatest parts of anything in Star Wars ever. One of my favorite franchises of all time being Star Wars. That means it's one of my favorite endings of any movie ever. I really do love the entirety of the Battle of, of Endor. And of course, the throne room stuff, which is just some of my favorite good versus evil in any movie. For me, Jabba's palace is iconic. I love the costuming. I love all of the stuff around it. There are goofy moments. The, it is a, a sequence that does feel a little out of place when it comes to the rest of the movie because it is a long sequence for just getting Han back. But I do like that it's earned the fact that they do go through a lot of problems. The fact that they do have to go through these trials and tribulations to get this character back, who is one of the emotional cruxes of the previous movie this is an a for me this movie i think it'll be fair to say though it is below a new hope yes so now we move back to middle earth and we go to lord of the rings the two towers and this is a film that is also excellent as sequels go this is one of the great sequels of all time i would not say it's better than the empire strikes back though in my opinion and this for me has always been my least favorite of the trilogy, which is not really saying much because I think this is still an S tier. This is an awesome movie in pretty much every way. Great character development. And I do think the the Frodo and Gollum stuff here is so, so good. It works so well. And this movie in particular, you see a lot of great work from Elijah Wood as you see Frodo's descent. And getting to see this one again recently, I've re-fallen in love with Two Towers even more every time I've watched it. And it is closer with fellowship than it used to be like it used to be definitively my third favorite now it is very close with fellowship and i love them both for different reasons but i would still put this one in s, s tier the two towers is a film that i've always been partial to i have never watched any of the lord of the ring uh, trilogy films in their theatrical version i've started extended and i've kept it extended even seeing it in theaters the only reason i went to do that was because they were in extended cuts and i think this is a film that definitely benefits the most from that but also loses a little bit of its charm its pacing and especially faramir who you know he does not get a really strong presence in the theatrical films in the original text he is almost like a mirror image to boromir he should be as equal if not as great if not greater even though the two towers never really does make him greater i think it does make smart storytelling choices and it's shown in the extended edition for how he's kind of put narratively in worse situations than his brother and how he's still lived with honor. He's still trying to do the right thing and he struggled. But <laughs> there's so many iconic scenes in this film. I, I just love everything to do around and building up to Battle of Helm's Deep. Yeah, it's, it's such an iconic battle. I don't think there has been anything that has come close to it. For me, I would just edge out fellowship of the ring i would put it ahead of it because i've i've always put it a little ahead of fellowship and that's fine with me to compromise on that point because i do love them both and it, like i said this most recent time watching it it was closer than it's really ever been i'm just more partial to the world building and the initial starting of fellowship but i do think this is also a masterpiece next up we have episode one the phantom menace you know we got to see this recently you know we got to see the phantom menace as the first film of our may the fourth marathon i mean i was always a fan of the pod race it was incredible to see the full race even if that is a little bit of an overlong sequence in the film i just love his love of oh you know his old school racing days and hot rods kind of brought to full life here you know it's an, it's indulgent for sure but it's the perfect energizer for this film and that tattooing sequence it takes a while to get going it really is that pod race that makes it worthwhile as much as i like qui-gon and obi-wan and everything going on with the gungans the actual queen sequences everything going on with the trade federation taking over i find a lot of that dialogue to be so stilted and so difficult to get through there's so much about this film that is 
iconic and only continues to get better. But there is still a lot about this film that fundamentally I don't think is great. You know, I'll, I'll put this in like a low B tier. I'm glad you said B tier because I am definitely saying B tier for The Phantom Menace. I've always appreciated The Phantom Menace a little bit more than most people did. This was my first Star Wars movie when I was growing up. So I have a ma major soft spot for this movie. It was one of the things that really inspired me to love cinema when I was a kid. And I watched this endlessly. There's so many things I love about it. And even as I've gotten older and started to at least understand and try to appreciate some of the flaws, there's so many things about The Phantom Menace and the way it created the prequel style, which you said a, a great thing about unadulterated George Lucas. And this is really, I think, something I've grown to appreciate about the prequels over the years as I've gotten older is that the prequels are fully the auteurist version of George Lucas. This is his visual style. This is him just poured into his Star Wars movies, where the first three are a bit more tame, more traditional, more based on the Flash Gordon type of story that he wanted to tell as an homage. The Phantom Menace is amongst the most George Lucas of movies ever. Uh, and this movie, there's so many amazing things. Like you said, Duel of the Fates, Pod Race, Qui-Gon Jinn, and like I said earlier, partial to beginnings and origins and i think this does a solid job of laying the foundation of the prequels even if it is the most distant from the other two so i would say certainly b tier i i can't ignore the flaws that that do make it b tier but uh, i truly do love that movie and then we get into attack of the clones which i think also has an excellent visual style even if CGI is a bit overused in this movie, I think some things have not aged well, where Phantom Menace still uses quite a bit of practical and I think has aged visually much better outside of the green hills of Naboo. Attack the Clones has a lot of bad looking green screen. It does have a lot of backdrops that look poor. I do think CGI models still look really good for a lot of the clones, a lot of the droids. Yoda, I think, still looks quite good. The Battle of Geonosis is one that I fall in love with every single time I watch it. Just looks amazing. One of the best looking war scenes in all of Star Wars. But this movie does have the romance between Anakin and Padme. As much as I love watching it because it's hilarious, it's not very good. And I think just from that alone, as much as I love and appreciate the prequels, as much as I've grown up with this movie and can watch it endlessly, this is a C tier for me. I love everything that Obi-Wan goes through in this film. This is probably Obi-Wan's best film for me, even though he has maybe more iconic lines in Revenge of the Sith. I think this is the one that is actually about the character, his evolution, what he's facing and what he's you know, really stepping into as one of the more notable Jedi. This is like almost his semi origin story too. I think aesthetically, this was a film that really hit more of like the sociopolitical angle that we're trying to see George Lucas trying to tell with the CIS, you know, the breakaway states, talk about how the world of Coruscant, the galaxy is starting to get grimier, worn out. This is not the same world as episode one. And I think the aesthetic here, when it is done really well, is great. But because this is one of the first true digital films with full digital mockups, some planets like Geonosis and all that don't always look great. And that is a very, 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 very difficult romance to nail. And yeah, I don't think George Lucas was ever going to be able to do that. I don't think many writers could. That is, It is hard to make that work. I think I still would put it maybe bottom of B. I'm okay with doing that. I love the, <laughs> I love the attack of the clones, so I would bump it up. Next up, we have Lord of the Rings, Return of the King. Talk about one of the best trilogy enders. Like You can argue Empire Strikes Back is probably the best direct sequel ever. I don't know if there's many sagas, franchises that have ever had a trilogy ender of this magnitude. I mean, it won so many Oscars. And it's not for a lack of like, oh, just because all the storylines are coming together, we just kind of have to make up for the first two films. No, it's genuinely incredible. But I think I can't put it at the top of S for myself. Because as I've gotten older and as I've gotten to you know, engage with a little bit more of the actual Tolkien text, I've always found it a little disappointing on how Saruman is used. If you've seen the theatrical edition, he's not in this film. Right. It's with the extended that they give him an out at the very start of this film. I think the scouring of the Shire is really important to the to the Hobbits. There just wasn't time for that. Even for a 15, 20 minute sequence, I would have taken that any day. I do think sometimes, though, it is overstuffed. It really does become that finale that you're like, OK, this is like the fourth or fifth ending. It is those small flaws in this very long film that start cropping up for me a little bit. 
but still <laughs> it's it's my second favorite on this list i'll put it right after empire strikes back yeah i get those book criticisms and i enjoy the book too i enjoyed tolkien's text too but to me this is a masterpiece and i'd put this at the top of s right now this is probably like my second favorite movie of all time and i you guys all know what my favorite movie of all time is if you watch these tier lists just speaking purely from a critical standpoint as well like the product that's put here in this film is, is just unbelievable the way they're able to wrap up all these different storylines make it a satisfying ending in my opinion for pretty much everyone and keep the emotional hooks still there while keeping the same style the same intrigue the same excitement some of the best fantasy battles you'll ever see put to screen this is just to me on every level such an incredible movie and it speaks volumes that four and a half hours when you watch the extended cut just fly by i just think this is such an amazing movie and so for me i'd put it ahead of the empire strikes back we could just start with with revenge of the sith here because if you've watched any of our tier lists i've always said this is my favorite movie ever i love revenge of the sith but i'm Every time we do these tier lists, I do always acquiesce to to Sonic and give him Empire Strikes Back because I'm not a blind person. I know the that Revenge of the Sith is not as good as Return of the King or the Empire Strikes Back or Two Towers or Fellowship of the Ring. It's not. I'm still going to say S tier and I would put it ahead of Two Towers and Fellowship just to get my favorite movie of all time up there. But on my list, I actually would have Return of the King first just because I do think it's the best movie we are ranking here. It's tough because Revenge of the Sith has also improved for me again after a few years of kind of staying stuck. I think I was telling Liam at the screening, I was like, oh, this might be pushing Empire for the first time in years for me. It ultimately didn't because seeing Empire even with zero sleep, I was like, oh, masterpiece. But every time you watch this, you're like, Anakin, don't do it and then he does it right and it, it's effective that even with still some you know kind of stilted dialogue for hayden some cringe here and there it's incredible just how letting hayden act letting hayden put on the mask and like become vader and see the pain crack through that does so much for that performance you know i would give it to you i'll put it ahead of the two towers it, it, it is a film okay. that flies by it's it's hard to de deny that and i will also give you for this list return of the king over the empire okay. strikes back next up we have episode seven the force awakens this is where it always gets tough because this is when we dive into the most recent entries of both franchises and you know no matter if you love it or don't it's definitely had a lot more discourse for both of them over the years if there's a film that is relatively unscathed it is the force awakens because that was probably that film of that whole requel era where it's a remake it's a sequel it's it's kind of its own thing i think i've become a little bit more positive on this film more recently but like i've been saying on our most recent tier list the biggest problem for me is the lack of world building like the world building here is just non-existent and it, the worst part is there are the scenes that he filmed discussing all this that's that's my biggest struggle with this film because i think if you add just a semblance of world building it makes every other film in this trilogy so much better because then you just have to scatter it out build out the scenes and characters but i will say i do love the the visceral feeling that this film has like the fighting everything is it's rich it has a lot of that prequel cleansing cleanliness in some ways but you can see people flying being hit by blaster shots in a way that's been missing through basically all of star wars and i really did like that for me it is a bottom of a yeah i've always liked the force awakens a lot i used to love the force awakens this was one of my favorites um outside my favorite easily still of the sequel trilogy but my favorite disney movie it used to be and it's dropped a little bit for me over time i think as the sequels have started to set worse and worse when i watched them especially the ending there are a lot of things that we've talked about with the mystery elements of this that just don't end up paying off and that is unfortunate because i think this movie does stand very well on its own and can be watched and enjoyed as like you were saying a requel but i do think it works really well as a nice fast-paced exciting film as an homage to the original trilogy i think all those things work this is the best in terms of comedy in my opinion across all of them i think harrison ford gives an awesome performance here he delivers 
in the role of Han Solo. And I think all of the leads give great performances here. I think Daisy Ridley is awesome. I do think John Boyega gives his best performance. This is the best Finn movie by a mile. In the last tier list, I put this in B tier and I did put it behind the Phantom Menace for me now. Yeah, I mean, I'm fine with you know, compromising it a little bit, putting it at like top of B. And then we get to The Hobbit, An Unexpected Journey, which also for me is a movie I really like. I know I'm in the minority on this movie, but I think people overall have started to come around to this arguably, and I think definitively being the best Hobbit movie. There was a big push for Desolation of Smog for a while. And while I think that movie improves on a lot of things, I don't know if it hits the same notes for me. This is a classic Middle Earth style adventure. And although it is extended out three times as big as it really should be, this whole story, uh, I appreciate how this movie flows. I think this movie flows like one of the original three movies. It has a great beginning, middle and end. I don't necessarily agree with people who say it takes too long to get going in the Shire. I think it's it's an awesome book accurate sequence with the dwarves coming in and having this big party, all these songs, and it feels like fellowship to me. Um, it can get bogged down when they do try to tie it back as a prequel. I actually even, I don't think Radagast is that bad. He's barely in the movie, so I don't really agree that he ruins it. And Azog, I think, is a pretty good villain in this one, especially for keeping that pace, that kind of chase type pacing that they have in this movie where you just constantly got to keep going because somebody's after you. I do think a lot of the standout sequences from the book do work well in this, like the riddles in the dark and like the troll sequence. I think both of those sequences are very fun in the novel and they do a great job adapting them. So I like this movie quite a bit. I wouldn't put it in A, but I would put it at the top of B. This is my favorite Hobbit film as well. It, I think it's just the most competent because this is probably the one closest to what Guillermo del Toro, if he was still directing these films when it was a duology probably would have hit you know he might have been a little bit strange or more esoteric with it i do think some of this film gets a bit of a bad rep because they do almost overdo like the dishes sequence and the singing and all that but you know this is a fun film i do remember reading the hobbit and then watching this and i was like this is pretty close like the troll sequence like you said it's iconic and it's a great reference in fellowship but actually seeing it play out here I did really like it. Yeah, I guess Azog, this is probably his best film, but I, I think I would have preferred the actual costume design they had in the first place. I don't think the CGI for a lot of this film really holds up for me. I think, especially in a lot of the goblin sequences, it, it really is hidden away because it is such poor lighting. It's just lamps and all that. And the color grading is so saturated too. So it avoids a lot of like the criticisms that... I think would have been more apparent and scenes like with Azog and all that. So if I were to put this on, yeah, I would I would say like maybe a mid B for me. I'd arguably put it just ahead of the Phantom Menace, but my heart is saying after the Phantom Menace. Okay, well if you say after, I would put it ahead of everything here. So then we'd put it right in between behind Force Awakens and ahead of Phantom Menace. Next up we have the first Star Wars story. Rogue One, so much of Garrett Edwards' original vision is what's kind of showing up in the middle of the film and with the team-ups. It's the stuff in the finale that, okay, you can say that's changed, it's become better for sure because of Tony Gilroy, but what is still there is the Garrett Edwards introductions to a lot of characters. The only one for sure that definitely got changed that we know is Cassian Andor, and that just screams Gilroy. It, it feels so connected to what we see of his characterization in Andor, but I do not like the characters for the first half of this film. I don't think... We really get to know them that well. I don't really see the emotional stakes that everybody has. I You can say Chirut and everyone else, like they're fun and all that. But then at the same time, I, I struggle with um, Bodhi Rook, right? I feel like that's a character that is a bit wasted here. I, I find them to be a well put together ensemble, but I don't think I really ever buy the full emotional stakes of anyone outside of Cassian with Jin in that final third. I just don't know if I really love the heroes of this film. I love the villains. I love how Tarkin is used here, even if it's not perfect. I think this was a film that with Andor will become a lot better for me. As it stands right now, it is a A-tier film. I would put it 
in A tier as well. At the bottom of A tier, this is still my favorite Disney movie since you know last time we did the tier rankings. I still have the same rankings for Star Wars across the board, and and Rogue One I think works in so many ways. I would agree with you that the opening third is the weakest part of this movie, and I do think the characterization of Jin is fairly weak until the middle of the movie or at least the end of that opening third when you get the sequence with her and galen i think it works wonders i've been unapologetic about the fact that i've read catalyst prior to seeing this movie i read it in the month leading up to rogue one in anticipation of rogue one and i think that enhanced my viewing experience so much like it was on repeat viewings that the first act with its editing specifically in the first 20 minutes did start to show its flaws. But I do think all the characters round out fairly well by at least the middle of the movie. I love K2, one of my favorite droids of all time. And I think he works extremely well throughout the entire movie, especially his introduction is awesome. And then Aunt Cassian, I do think works well this entire movie. I do really like Cassian. I love the, his introduction. I love this movie and I love rewatching it. I love the excitement of it. So I would put it in A tier as well, but I would actually put it behind Return of the Jedi. Yeah, that's fine. Next up, we have Star Wars Episode Eight: The Last Jedi. Of course, going to be a controversial one when we talk about it. Uh, to summarize the thoughts I've said a million times on this channel, this is a movie that looks beautiful. It has incredible direction. And I think Ryan Johnson really nailed it making a Ryan Johnson movie. The problems with this movie for me are the Star Wars connections. I do think there are a lot of things that don't work in terms of building off of The Force Awakens. I don't particularly like Finn's journey. I don't particularly like Poe's journey. I do enjoy all the sequences with Rey and Luke and Kylo Ren. And I do think Daisy Ridley and Adam Driver kind of carry this movie. They do a great job when they are on screen together with their chemistry. Uh, Mark Hamill gives a great performance, but I've said many times this is not the direction I would have taken Luke, and especially by the end of the movie, I would have left him alive if this was the direction you were going to take him, especially knowing that Carrie Fisher had passed away before this movie came out. You could have just gotten rid of that last scene where he dies and saved that similar type of emotional death for episode nine, so you could have one of the big three in episode nine, but alas, they didn't do that, and I that really rubs me the wrong way every time I watch it. I would put this movie in C tier, and I do have it after Attack of the Clones, which also would have been in my C tier. Yeah, this is definitely where we differ for sure. I mean, I'm a huge fan of the Arthurian late stage kind of story that we go here for Luke. I think it is so well done. And yeah, maybe there is some moments that are a little cheap with that story. And the nature of this is that it's a film being made 30 something years after the primes of a lot of the actors without Carrie Fisher being there to really fully complete the film, even if her scenes were for the most part completed. And I think still Ryan Johnson did the right choices with this character. It's just that we don't have that 30 year gap fleshed out yet. And the moment we start getting that, I think instantly gets better. But I love everything with Ray. I love everything with Kylo. I always find myself saying this is an A tier for me. I think it's better than the first Hobbit film, but you know, it's it's whatever. Okay. Well, I I I have it after, and not just to put it for my taste, but I do have Hobbit as the top of my B. I would say I'd put it. I would fight for behind the Hobbit. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. Next up, we have. The Desolation of Smog. I think my problem for me starts coming with like a lot of the unnecessary changes that start coming up in this. Like we start getting that weird romance. I would rather watch Anakin and Padme's <laughs> romance uh, in episode two again and again and again. There's the whole plot line with Sauron and Saruman and everyone else trying to do their own thing with Rad, I guess, kind of all figured into it, which is... It's not bad, but it, it feels like such a left turn. And I guess it's like a fun way of expanding on why Gandalf is missing for so long. It just doesn't work for me. <sighs> Ooh, this might be my first C. I would also agree on C tier for Desolation of Smaug. And when it came out, I would have had it a little higher. I understood when it came out why people liked it a little bit more than the original Hobbit. It's more unique visually like having smaug that's something you don't see in any of the other lord of the rings right and it's an amazing sequence i think it works so so well i don't like that not all of them go up to the mountain that's something i never really liked that's not in the book and it purely just is to do the romance which i think is awful but there are so many things that are great about this movie and that's where like it's a light c for me because 
there are so many awesome sequences like the barrel sequence in the book is a memorable one and it is so good in this movie Merkwood I think works excellently as well there's also the whole smog sequence is great in the extended edition one of the additions that they cut out there's a lot more Bayorn and I love Bayorn in the book and he's he's really good in this and I'm all for them making changes from book right like any adaptation is going to have a change as long as you don't make changes that are worse than the book or make changes that are just relatively dumb and the romance is is pretty bad because it's not a central part of the movie it's this little tiny side plot that just is really stupid but they don't try to make it the crux of the emotional hooks of this movie it's just a dumb extra side plot so that doesn't really work for me all of lake town is pretty bad my only other little criticism with desolation of smaug is the ending unexpected journey I think still works and is still paced quite well because it is pretty much half of the Hobbit book. Desolation of Smaug almost takes it to the end of the Hobbit book, but then it decides to just cut the ending with Smaug, the, the payoff for Smaug, to save something exciting for the next movie because they know that the Battle of the Five Armies is just a very small chapter in the book. Ultimately, some of those decisions would make me drop it to C. It would be towards the top of my C. Next up, we have Solo, a Star Wars story, a movie that uh, I've never really loved, but I also have never disliked. This has kind of been that firm middle ground Star Wars movie for me. It feels very unnecessary. We didn't need this movie, but since we have it, there's a lot of fun to be had here. And I do think Alden Ehrenreich's portrayal of Han is quite good. Donald Glover's portrayal of Lando is awesome. I'm not a big fan of a lot of the extraneous characters. I don't think a lot of them work that well. Beckett is kind of forgettable, but I do really like Kira. So this movie is always just firmly sat in C for me. I think every version of Star Wars Tears we've done, it's always been there. Solo is a difficult film because it feels like a compilation film and it didn't need to be. Uh, we should have seen a little bit more of like the Academy stuff, but him being an Imperial cadet before he's just thrown into Mimban, right? This is a film that feels like it skips over some of the more juicier, like a little bit more unknown elements about Han Solo, right? It's trying to go for all the points that do feel familiar and you're like, oh, I see how he's just a step away from that version. Oh, like this is what he had to let go of and all that. I love, I love, love though. I love the Kessel Run. But then this is the same film that has L3 and oh, this Imperial guy calling Han because he's alone solo, which... Uh, not not great not great so it is a c tier for me next up we have the final R skywalker saga film the rise of skywalker episode nine i don't know i mean i really do love the lore of this film i think it has some of the best cinematography of the jj abrams films i think he brings a real real sense of kineticism you know i don't fault this film for what it does with carrie fisher's scenes from the force awakens and kind of being put here i love everything with palpatine it's just that it's a fetch quest for 45 minutes when you're just jumping to planets you're literally light speed skipping at the end of the day we still don't get the announcement of his return we get it in Fortnite of all things which is still such a massive bummer for me again like i'll always say you make this three hours this is a great film for me i would have really enjoyed it could have called it an average Star Wars film but i think all the concepts thrown in here would make more sense this goes like a bottom of c for me i can't really hate any star wars film but i could also see this being pushed down to a D tier. Yeah, for me, I I don't really hate this movie, but there's so many things that are missed opportunities in this movie, and it's really frustrating. Every time I watch it, this movie just frustrates me more and more. And I've never liked that Ray is a Palpatine. I think that's a really dumb move, especially when it worked really, really well, in my opinion, to just have her be a nobody. I'm okay with that. I didn't need her to be Palpatine. I would have preferred her to be a Skywalker and that be revealed in The Force Awakens. Just right off the bat, let's just get it out of the way like we do with Kylo Ren. And as much as I love Ian McDermott, and I love so many lines that he says here because they are campy, and I love that campy Palpatine was back. He didn't need to be in this movie. Palpatine should not have been in this movie. I do think it hurts Return of the Jedi a little bit. And I, I think ultimately this movie just is searching for something. It's searching the entire movie for a purpose. It's searching for the entire movie for an emotional crux. It's searching the entire movie for a reason to be the most important Star Wars movie ever. And it has a really hard time ever really finding it. And in those moments where they could unite the saga, I think those are the saddest 
most disappointing ones. You could unite the saga and have Rey not just hear the voices of these Jedi, but have actual Force ghosts appear. You could unite the saga by having Luke as a big part of this. Last line he says in The Last Jedi, see you around, kid, to Kylo Ren. Never appears to Kylo Ren in this movie. But ultimately, it just I, I think it hurts so many different things about Star Wars, and, and I really just don't love this movie. I, every time I watch it, it frustrates me over and over and over again. I put in an F tier on our last Star Wars tier list. I put it in F tier here. But if you have an NC, that also makes it a D. And that makes us go to the last movie. And I think overall, between Rise of Skywalker and Hobbit, the Battle of the Five Armies, we were talking about the two worst movies on this entire tier list back to back. And unfortunately for me, The Hobbit, the Battle of the Five Armies, when they made this movie, when they announced that it was a trilogy, when they announced this was the title of the last movie, it was going to have a hard time escaping. Did we need this? Because it is just a very small chapter of the book. And even though... A lot of people do try to attribute the fact that this is a two hour and 20 minute battle to the, the idea that it doesn't have book related stuff. It does. And it does have really good book related stuff in the first 20 to 30 minutes. There are some really good stuff and I think good payoff with Thorin and with Bilbo. Unfortunately, that's also just a couple chapters in the book. <laughs> and then once you get through the actual material there, there's nothing left really for the battle. It's just Peter Jackson and Weta just doing as much CGI fighting as we can possibly get, where some of the battles and the sequences in the original Lord of the Rings trilogy felt so epic and amazing because there's so many practical effects amongst the CGI masses that are used. Here, it's just nonstop CGI for two hours, and it does get old. It does get repetitive. It really does feel pointless. I Like I said, for Desolation of Smaug, I don't like that they saved Smaug's death for the beginning of this movie because it feels like just a plot point that they use to just make this movie have an exciting opening, but it, I don't think that works that well. I don't hate this movie because it is kind of pointless rather than something that frustrates me like The Rise of Skywalker. Like I don't think they could have done anything better with the plot they had here they had basically the last like four chapters of the hobbit to work with so for me this would be a d tier i would put it ahead of the rise of skywalker to me this is an f tier i do not like this film this is the fakest looking middle earth thing ever it's it just it's so rough seeing how much the cgi budget was just thrown here and i hate the concept of dragon sickness there's so much to be said about thorin having that greed you know, having been overcome by it, but then saying, oh, it's because he's around smog and all these different things. And it's just like, what? What, what, what? Why are we getting this? Why is the gold now being tainted and corrupting him and all? It's just it's I hate that concept. It's just not good. Yeah, I don't like it. And then the fact that he like he overcomes it, it just doesn't make sense to me. I, I really don't like that. I like the ending <laughs> because you're back in the Shire and you get to see more of that classic Bilbo and everything. But I understand that in the book, Bilbo is knocked out. And that's why this battle feels so short. And that naturally you have to extend it out and all that. Okay, fine. I, I get that. But is this a film's worth? No. I, I think episode nine, as much as I struggle with it, I find it to be something that can be redeemed and built out. And it still is a finish. This does. This feels like something that was just thrown out there. For the sake of extreme, extreme capitalism, this is an F tier. Well, then I will give you bottom of D, considering it is my second lowest, and it is you have Rise of Skywalker in C, so that puts it a little higher. I would argue against the dragon sickness thing. That's in the book. I don't hate that. Like the Arkenstone push and drive Thorn's greed to me is not that big of a problem. I actually think it works relatively well. I'd give you that I would like to see a little bit longer. You could have cut some of the action in favor of these character beats and exploring and building that out because that is a big turn that they move away from for just action. So I'll give you that. I don't mind that sequence overall because I, it is out of the book and he does redeem himself in the book. I'm okay with putting it at the bottom. I do think it's a better overall product personally than rise of skywalker because it doesn't frustrate me but that's our joint tier list thank you so much for watching and make sure you check out right now my tier list this is how i would have ranked everything we referenced it a bunch during the video this is how i would rank everything that you see here on this tier list and then here's sonix and this is how he would rank everything you see on the tier list Thank you so much for watching. We will be adding this tier list to the description of this video. So if you would like to rank it yourself, make sure you rank it, save your choice, 
and post it on social media. You can tag us at Star Wars Lads. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, everything. Make sure you look up our channel and tag us so we can see how you guys would rank this as well. I've been adding the live poll fo function actually for these tier lists as well. So if you guys want to go and add your options to the live tier list that's on the link, make sure you do that as well. It will create this group ranking of how we would all rank these so make sure you check that out keep an eye out for more content here in the future from star wars lads thank you so much for watching this video and we will see you all next time